This is Ocean Beach near Strawn, on the west coast of Tasmania. The Payne family lives at Zeehan, just a few kilometres inland, in some of Tasmania's wildest and wettest country. Graham Payne works in the Renison tin mine. His wife, Sissy, and his children, Marsha and Nicholas, like coming down here to the beach. Sometimes on nice hot days, Dad goes down there fishing. Sometimes I go with him, sometimes I don't. <laughs> it's, it's an escape away from Zion. You're sort of in a completely different world, because you're going from the, um, the uh, same looking houses, same looking streets. You're going down onto a beach where there's miles and miles and miles of beach. You've got the, the ocean, it's always changing, and uh, it's just a completely different world altogether. Zeehan, where the Paynes live, is a town that sprang up in the boom mining years early this century. But its heyday didn't last long, and by World War I, it seemed that its best days were over. It became a sort of ghost town. About 20 years ago, though, the town began to come to life again. The Renison tin mine, a few kilometres away, was developed, and miners and their families flooded in to live in the company houses and earn the large salaries paid to underground miners. The centre of the town still has lots of old buildings, and even locals like the Paynes enjoy looking at the way things used to be. The mining museum still gives some idea of what it meant to be a West Coast miner in the early 1900s. And it all starts over again. It's back here. Man in the bottom floors above. You'll be up here winding it up. The tip it out. Then it'll... That, that one won't set up. Yeah. Sometimes they have two men on there. If it's here. Man in the bottom floors above. It won't be hard work, wouldn't it? Hmm. Inside, the ones outside. Yeah. yeah. Mum. We open the front of it on the smoke box. The man who looks after the museum is George Smith, who lived in Zeehan in its early boom days. So Zeehan was an important place. That time Zeehan was the third town in the state in size. It had the biggest railway yard. There used to be 12 steam engines shunting in, in the yard under steam every lunchtime, going somewhere or coming from somewhere. There was 15 hotels licensed at the one time, so there was 27 here at one time and another. 27 different hotels on different sites. In November 1882, the Gobi Theatre was open for a gala ball, a Catholic ball. It seated a thousand people. There was a then a Nundas L there, commonly known as the sausage wrapper. The butchers in those days wrapped up the meat in newspaper. That's how it got the name. The baker called every day, and he'd bring you papers. The ma mailman called a couple of times a day. There were telegraph messengers everywhere. It was busy. Yeah, and on Saturday night, it was late night, there were so many people in the town, so much of the population out, you had to walk off the footpath and come off the road. And J.C. Williamson used to send their shows to Tasmania via Zeehan, to Strawn, then to Zeehan, then on to Hobart and Launceston. So Zeehan was an important place. My particular job all well, starts 
we'll take a day shift. It starts well, 6 o'clock, get out of bed, have your breakfast, uh, 6.30, catch the bus to work, arrive approximately 7 o'clock. Uh, from the time you get to work, you're changed. Quarter past seven, day shift starts. By the time Marsha wakes at seven, Sissy's already up and working in the kitchen. Uh, I call round to the shift boss's office, uh, local terms, the chicken run, because uh, you, you get in there, you can't get out, <laughs> they shut the door on you, <laughs> and uh, go to the window, we get our instructions of what we've got to do, who we've got to work with, whether we're working on our own, or how far down the mine we're working. The school Marsha and Nicholas go to is the only one in Zeehan. It's a primary school. There's no high school in the town. Marsha's in grade five. Graham's job underground is to operate a rock bolter a machine that reinforces the roofs and walls of the mine where they're weak. The job involves boring holes in the back, in the backs or the roofs of those places. Uh, three metre holes, approximately uh, up to 38 millimetres in diameter the holes are. And uh, after the hole is bored, the machine itself will put in a rock bolt. They're held in place by a quick set resin. The resin is also fed up the hole by the machine. It's a, it's a mighty machine. It's something that can have to be seen to be working. And uh, fires the resin up the, tube, up the hole where the bolt goes in. The machine tightens the bolt up. And it's just a matter of continuing on in a series. It, it's a very repetitious job, but a, very, a good job, clean job. Clean as far as underground standards go, for sure. And uh, oh, we have our, have our moments out there, breakdowns and a few minor rock falls. Nothing serious, but uh, I suppose there's always that chance of something that will serious that will happen. These men are working about 500 metres underground. They get the ore out by drilling holes, filling them with explosive and then blasting.
After the explosion, the scalers go in to make sure no dangerous loose rocks are left on the roof of the chamber. Then the big 35-tonne trucks come in, are loaded with ore and carry it up the sloping roads to the surface. After the ore is brought to the surface, it has to be treated so that tin and other valuable metals can be taken out. It goes through a series of crushing and chemical treatment processes in the huge plant that sits directly above the mine. In the treatment plant, and in the mine itself, the latest in technology is used to keep things running smoothly. It's very different from the way things used to be in the mines in the old days. When I was going to school, there was 36 mine whistles blowing at the one time within sight of the town. Now there's none. And when the First World War started, well, the market collapsed. All the bullion used to go to Germany. Practically every able-bodied man in the town enlisted. And then there was no men here. People just packed a tin truck, took it on the train, left the door open and walked out and left the gear. General feeling or physical feeling of working in a place like Renison, well, to me, it's just like working outside, but only it's dark, 24 hours a day. When I say dark, it's dark. You turn your light off, you don't know where you are. It's not a, not a thing that shines anywhere. Um, to me, it, I, I couldn't work, I could work any, somewhere else, but at the moment, the job that I've got, I couldn't see it going anywhere else, you know. It's just the, way, just the life that I've got into as far as working underground. Um, it's something that's completely different from anywhere else to work. At home, I like to um, do a bit of cooking just a normal housework. Um, I have lots of friends down, or I go up to their houses, watch the soapies, <laughs> just the normal things that housewives do. I don't get bored, there's no time to get bored really, because kids get out quarter to three anyway. I like living in Zion. I reckon it'd be the best mining town on the west coast. I like the people. Um, it's a good environment, I think. The weather doesn't worry me. I like the snow, when it does snow. Um, the isolation doesn't worry me because we go up the coast every fortnight anyway. Well, it does rain a lot. It does. It does get you down because the kids are stuck inside with nothing to do. Graham can't go fishing or whatever he wants to do. And, yeah, I don't like them home. <laughs> I like them out. But I like the snow and that. I do. I don't like the hot weather. Yeah, I'm a cold person. <laughs> Even when it's lunchtime, the miners don't come up to the surface. They eat in a crib room cut out of solid rock half a kilometre away from daylight. It's an unusual way to earn a living, but they're well paid for it. Zian has the highest income per head of population in the whole of Tasmania, mostly because of the underground miners. And if it wasn't for the money, how many of these men would be working somewhere else? Um, 
um, shopping in Zen is um, limited on some things. You can't get like, a lot of furnishings. But what they haven't got here, you can always send them up to Coast for them to be here the next day on Redline Coach or whatever, or there's um, trucks that come down every day anyway. We've got a couple of supermarkets here. Um, news agents, um, clothes stores for, for children, men and women. The Neighbourhood Centre um, holds lots of activities for women during the day, like there's an uh, exercise program, you can do a bit of typing or anything like that. There's lots of things to do there. Kids that leave high school down here, um, well, the majority of them go on to the Queenstown College, but there's a few that just sort of hang around. Get that everywhere, I suppose. But, but there is um, women working here that I think should let the young ones have a go. I do. Uh, Marsha is... Um, I don't know, she's so full of life. She, I reckon she'll go a long way. She likes to travel. I don't know what she'll do when she leaves school, but I hope she goes to college and gets a bit of further education and does something with her life. I, do. But I think she will. She seems to be that way. But Nicholas, he'll be a truck driver through and through. <laughs> the, um, the way the news and the gossip travels in this town is unbelievable. <laughs> oh, it is. It comes from all directions, but it's good. <laughs> I like a bit of gossip every now and again. <laughs> it is hard to keep anything private in this town because we're all so close and we all know each other. We're in each other's pockets, <laughs> sort of thing. I like her. Um, Marsha's only got to do another year of primary here. Um, for high school, I'd like Marsha to go to Rosebury, I think, because of the roads. Um, not because of the schools, <laughs> it's the roads, I think, in the winter time when there's ice and snow on the road. She'd like to go to Queenstown High School and Murray High School, but like I said, the roads are a bit icy in the winter time and sometimes they can't get to school. Had to travel over on the bus. Have to get out of bed about six o'clock, leave at half past seven. Get out of school about quarter past three, half past three, and you get home about four o'clock or something. Nora had 85 who had the misfortune of being burnt out in a, in a house fire. And uh, it was uh, quite a shocking experience to come back home, especially after you'd left everything intact and come back home, there's nothing left at night. Except what we had in the car and the fast that was had on. Everything was gone. We soon recovered from the people in the town helping us out. Oh, oh it was amazing. Really good. But we had the house that night, this house given to us that night. And then, on well, the same night, we had people coming in with kids, um, toys for the kids, and checks were coming in from Renison, and all the people were having raffles. It's amazing what you can do for others, you know, when you have to, I reckon. I'd do the same for anybody here. People here, I don't know, we're just like one big family. Like if there's a crisis or anything, we all pitch in to help each other. Dad's a rock collector, and he's got all these rocks in the shed and in the lounge room and um, and the rocks that he doesn't want, I get them and so does Nicholas. My favourites are his gold and some of his opals, some of his tin and that from Renison. Oh, sometimes we go out to Dundas out the back and then we go out there at the Crocart mine and we help Dad finds some croquet, and that's where we get most of our croquet from. That one there. Yeah. Each member of the Payne family likes Zeon. But like most of the Zeon mining families, it's not their only home. They have a second house, up on the northwest coast at Sisters Beach.
Every second weekend, Denise packs up, and as soon as Graham gets home, they get into the car and head north. On Sunday night, they'll be back. And so will the other mining families who spent the weekend out of Zeehan. And for all those families, there's a question that sooner or later they'll have to answer. How long will it be before they leave Zeehan for the last time? <laughs>